for taking the time to attend this webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we do get started. Everyone will remain on mute for the duration of the presentation, but there is a chat bar in your control panel, so feel free to chat in questions um, during and at the end of the presentation, and our um, presenter will answer questions at the end of the webinar. And just a quick little introduction um, about the webinar. Today is, the webinar is Buying Medications Online, How to Do It Safely and Affordably. Um, we have Shabira Safdar, who's the Director of National Outreach um, for the Partnerships for Safe Medicines. Uh, the Partnership for Safe Medicines is a group of not-for-profit organizations and individuals that have policies, procedures, or programs to protect consumers from counterfeit or contraband medicines. I'm Elizabeth Messenger, and I'm the Director of Outreach at Needy Meds, and this is one of our Needy Meds special topic webinars. So before I pass it, pass it over, we are just going to do a quick poll just to get things started. So we're going to launch that poll right now. So the question is, do you know someone or have yourself ordered from an online pharmacy that stated it was not in the United States? Select one of the following. So if you want to start answering that question, we'll just wait a second. Okay, another minute. Okay. So it looks like we're pretty split, um, about 48% yes and 52% no. So at this time, I'm going to pass it along to Shabir if you want to give a little introduction and start your presentation. Good afternoon or good morning. If you are on the West Coast like myself, my name is Shabir Imber Saftar. I'm the Director of National Outreach for the Partnership for Safe Medicines, of which we are proud to count Needy Meds as one of our members. And so who we are is a, a, a not-for-profit incorporated in, in Virginia that works primarily on patient safety issues around counterfeit drugs, although we do do a lot of outreach to healthcare professionals. And, I'll, and if you want to know more about that, we can talk outside of the scope of this conversation, which is mostly about patients. Um, our mandate from our board, which includes um, very eminent experts in the pharmacy, law enforcement, and legal fields of counterfeit drugs is to help educate the public and reduce the problem of counterfeit drugs, which um, is actually really awful throughout a great deal of the world and getting worse in America. And that's mostly because of globalization and the porous nature of borders. Um, the, the, the poll question is actually very apropos. Um, there are, in fact, a lot of people who have encountered counterfeit drugs, and um, it bears a moment to think about how it is that, that uh, Americans ha are protected. Um, in particular, the, one of the most clear ways that we're protected, in fact, the only way that we're protected is because we have a regulated, closed, secure supply chain. Everybody from the person who manufactures the drug to the person who actually hands it to you at the last step before you take it is regulated within the US. Most of them, um, most of them by the FDA, but in some cases um, they are regulated at the state level. So pharmacists and, and uh, wholesalers are often actually regulated at the state level. Um, and that's part of sort of the challenge we've, we've seen in Massachusetts with compounding regulation and throughout the states. Other ways in which uh, folks are regulated include um, the fact that the FDA does extensive testing medications, um, the fact that there are uh, pharmacovigilance programs. If you actually have an adverse effect from a drug, what happens is you can make an adverse event report to the FDA and they actually collect those. And as, additionally, there are, um, when you are taking a drug, there is a physician or a pharmacist or both involved in the supervision of medication choices and the, the dosing and the protocol. Um, and we'll see, we've had a couple of cases, one just in the last week where people who actually were operating through an online pharmacy who did not have physician pharmacist supervision actually managed to uh, OD themselves on drugs they should not have been taking. So the most important thing about this is that the patients are protected basically because of the regulation and the closed supply chain, which is not true in many other countries. Any break in that supply chain exposes patients to to dangers, as I'll, as I'll demonstrate. 
So the most common way in which patients are endangered are that patients actually break the supply chain themselves. They will go online and they'll buy from a pharmacy that says they're in Canada, uh, when in fact they usually aren't, or they'll buy offline from a non-pharmacy. And we've seen a couple instances of those recently. Um, we saw in the south part of the U.S., uh, in Texas, there were fake antibiotics being sold in, uh, in, in basically bodegas, not, not pharmacies. They were targeted at the Spanish-speaking market. Their, their printing and writing was all in Spanish, and they were not, in fact, antibiotics. Um, and the, the problem was discovered in Texas when parents started bringing children into emergency rooms with infections that had run roughshod over their bodies. Uh, and so it is possible to both have online and offline breaks. A little less common, but unfortunately becoming more common, is we're seeing physicians who administer drugs in the office, like osteoporosis drugs or oncology drugs, actually buying from unlicensed distributors and then getting fake medication or adulterated medication. We've had a couple of incidences of pharmacists doing that and running their own online pharmacies within the U.S., which is sort of terrifying. They are, in fact, putting their pharmacy license uh, at risk. And then uncommonly, but still it does happen, we've seen um, We've seen specific incidences where uh, in the supply chain, um, you all probably remember the heparin problem of many, many years ago, and that is um, where a uh, an active pharmace pharmaceutical ingredient producer uh, managed to get a fake drug into the manufacturing supply chain, and that made its way all the way to patients. So, those are the different ways in which in which these problems happen. Um, you want to launch that next poll, Shabir? Uh, sure. Go ahead and launch the next poll. Okay. So we have one quick poll just to keep you all active. Um, can a Canadian pharmacist fill a prescription written by a U.S. physician? So please select yes or no, and if you want to begin answering that. This is a very common question that you see. Um, because there are so many websites claiming to be Canadian pharmacies, and of course they really aren't, they're neither Canadian nor, nor pharmacies, they have no pharmacy license even in Canada, um, but one of the popular questions people say is, well, you know, it's just like driving over the border. Um, but the fact is, uh, and I guess we'll see from the poll results, whether or not people think Canadian pharmacists can fill prescriptions. It looks like 44% think yes, 56% think no. The answer is no. <laughs> Legally, the answer is no. Uh, it's also no in the UK and many other what we would call first world nations. Um, they are not allowed to fill prescriptions written by um, foreign doctors who are not licensed to practice in that country. So if you go online to a, quote, Canadian pharmacy uh, and they ask you for your prescription from your U.S. doctor, they're not actually, they don't really care. They don't really need it uh, because they're already breaking the law. They cannot actually fill that prescription. So here's an example here of, of buying meds online. There is a weight loss drug uh, called Ally um, that was counterfeited uh, several years ago. And it, instead of containing the actual product, contained uh, subutramine, which is a prescription-only ingredient. And it has um, some, it's a very active ingredient. And so you need to be supervised by a doctor to take it. And I think it's actually already been taken off the market. And so what this person did was he made large quantities of this fake medication, printed fake boxes, and then sold them both wholesale and retail. He sold them wholesale to lots of people who then started selling them in places like Amazon stores, on eBay, on their own fake pharmacies. And he himself with a partner actually had a fake online pharmacy. Um, and they had many names, almost two-day diet shopping. And so people would buy this, and um, in some cases, they had lots and lots of horrible side effects that you can see at the right, because the active ingredient there uh, was, does not go well with people who have um, the conditions that, you know, you should not be taking them for. And we have, there's at least one person who had a pretty severe stroke, and his, he was an emergency room physician, so you'd think he would know better, but, you know, when people make one tiny bad judgment, they, uh, they end up paying a very serious price. And the folks in this case were actually convicted in 2011. Um, the overall population out there of online pharmacy websites is huge. 
And the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy does an annual review of those websites and consistently finds that 96 or 97 percent of those sites are out of compliance. Uh, they are either um, not in possession of any pharmacy license or they pretend to be in countries they're not. It's very simple to put up a website in the Philippines that says that you are Canadian pharmacy and it's very hard for a consumer to tell the difference. Many of them don't actually require a valid prescription. Uh, for example, if something that says it's a Canadian pharmacy that accepts a U.S. doctor's prescription is not requiring a valid prescription. And some of them are just have absolutely no basis for safety whatsoever. No pharmacy license, no licensed pharmacists, um, or they sell controlled substances, or they don't actually have um, secure connections to protect your credit card. Um, all when you when you get right down to it, there's only about three or four percent of all the websites out there that are actually licensed and legitimate and safe for U.S. consumers. And there is a way to see them, uh, but they um, but they're not. It's not obvious. And if you just randomly go and Google Canadian pharmacy or online pharmacy, you're going to get one of these bad ones. Now, even when you actually get the drug that you order, it is still quite dangerous. And we actually saw a death in the U.K. just this week. Um, this is actually from about a year and a half ago. Lorna Lambden was uh, an EMT in the UK. Uh, she w was presumably trained in how to read a physician's desk, desk reference, and she unfortunately went online and bought a sleeping aid and got what appears to be the real thing, but it is a, an, a an aid that was very sensitive to dosing and was not recommended uh, with to be taken with alcohol or with people with a potential heart arrhythmia. And she sat down with a glass of wine after a long shift and took the medication that she received, which did not have safety warnings or any pharmacist or, or physician oversight because it came from an online pharmacy. And she went into a coma and, uh, and died. And so she, um, she's a good example of where you know, it's not just about whether or not the drug is the right thing, but it's whether or not you're under the care of a, of a supervising physician. When, when people order from these online pharmacies, they're often not talking to their doctor about what they're getting first. Um, there's also a lot of really, really scary bad people out there who are selling things that should never be sold without the supervision of a, of a physician. We have seen, and this is an infographic we did last year, that there are people out there selling targeting to teens, birth control devices, including IUDs and other kinds of implants, and then publishing YouTube videos about how to insert them. The, the danger there is quite serious. Um, obviously, infection and death is far worse than even just the unintended pregnancy, and they are all over social media. They are working very, very hard to target people in every communications vehicle possible. And if anybody knows anything about the internet, it is not possible to regulate them very effectively from within the U.S. So those are patient breaks in the supply chain. There's also a number of physician breaks. Um, in the last two years, the FDA has discovered and pursued a, a cancer drug, a fake cancer drug that found its way into the U.S. What happened was um, someone in Turkey made a fake version of Avastin which is an anti-cancer injectable, often administered within a clinic setting, within a doctor's office. And then that was sold and resold a number of times to obscure its true origin until it ended up in the UK, a country that many doctors may feel safe ordering from. But in that case, even then, some of the doctors were not led to believe that that drug was coming from the UK. And so um, various shell companies in the US would fax doctors saying, I can sell you a Vastin for $400 less per dose than, than it's normally listed at. And a number of doctors did business with these entities. And when those drugs arrived um, from the UK directly, you know, they were puzzled by the fact that it had writing in Arabic on it instead of what you'd expect from a drug approved for the US market by the FDA. And it's not known how much of that drug ended up in patients. But they did, in fact, seize the material, and the FDA did test it, and it didn't have any active ingredient in it. And we've seen this with cancer drugs, osteoporosis drugs, and with Botox, with sometimes terrifying consequences. Um, you can see up there 
some photos of uh, a woman who was given counterfeit Botox. And you can see below that examples of Avastin that have been seized by the FDA. Um, this is becoming a big issue. Doctors are not well trained in secure supply chain issues. And so they are starting to make these mistakes, um, sometimes unintentionally and sometimes purpose purposefully. Um, the fake cancer medication uh, came through a crazy supply chain in order to obscure its true entity, being sold and resold from, from Turkey uh, through Switzerland, Denmark, the UK, uh, and then it enters a series of shell companies controlled by CanadaDrugs.com uh, and sold to American physicians by companies that were within the U.S. but actually were not, in fact, licensed distributors of the product. Finally, we're starting to see a couple of pharmacists who are breaking the supply chain themselves to make money. We saw a Chicago pharmacist just this month uh, who was substituting uh, real drugs from through his online pharmacy with fake Chinese counterfeits. Um, we saw a chain in New York that last year had stolen or uh, or basically bought from patients medications and then resold them. And then uh, back in 2005, one of the worst ones was counterfeit heart medication uh, that a Canadian pharmacist was basically having made, which contained just talcum powder and then selling to patients. And there were many deaths from that, entirely avoidable, preventable deaths. Um, we often see people talk about the safety of the UK and so, and that, oh, it, you know, this must be a safe country to import from. But it turns out actually that the fifth most likely country in which you will find counterfeit drugs is the UK. That is partially, and that report just came out this, this month, that's partially because the MHRA, which is their, their version of the FDA, is so aggressive about finding them. But those borders are very porous. And so they, they are finding because of their, because they're part of the EU and not everybody in the EU is, has great governance and regulatory authority over their pharmaceutical industry, that there are drugs entering the UK through their porous borders through parallel trade that are then finding their way into the supply chain. And it is terrifying. So there's a couple of myths. And what I want to do today is, is help you both talk, learn how to talk to your patient communities about the myths of buying online, but then quickly follow up with safe ways to save money online because that's really, you can't just say don't do this without also saying, but here's how you do it better. So I want to give you both. So let's go through a couple of myths first. First of all, Canadian online pharmacies are pharmacies in Canada with a website, and that is not true. Unless you actually drive into Canada and go to a bricks and mortar form pharmacy, overwhelming amounts of research and data from the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy finds that these are in fact not pharmacies. Um, what they are is someone who set up a website in Canada and typically the business model is that they're a shipping company and therefore they cannot be regulated by either the pharmacy boards or Health Canada. In fact, they don't even take possession of the drugs. They, When you go to their website and you maybe fax them or scan a prescription for something, they actually send it on to a partner in another country, maybe Pakistan, maybe China, maybe the UK, and that entity then sends you the drugs directly. So the drugs never even enter Canada. And they do this because the Canadian government knew that there were these shipping companies that were operating out of Canada and they told them that if they brought the drugs in, they were going to try and find a way to regulate them. And so they just worked around it. So it is not the same. Driving into Canada is not the same as going to a Canadian pharmacy. Um, the FDA has done a lot of research in this and found that um, that there's a number of people who practice this way and they've tried to prosecute as many as possible. Um, I'm not sure why that slide is blank. Oh, it's got to fade in. Um, those Canadian pharmacies or pretend pharmacies look very realistic online and heavily work social media in order to try and hook their audience. Just recently, um, a gentleman who was one of the pioneers of the Canadian online pharmacy movement, who you can see in that picture holding stacks of orders, was uh, actually finally caught. And 
his pharmacy that the FDA had prosecuted uh, was selling really, really important chronic medications that were fake. Lipitor, et cetera, et cetera, Celebrex, Crestor, all of these medicines, and he would claim they were Canadian medicines, but they were fakes from all over, from all over the world. And, uh, and he was giving them to American patients who were paying for them. Um, both the US, the FDA, and Health Canada have been very clear um, that, they, that they cannot control what gets sold uh, on websites within their country. And so you have to be very, very careful. Um, furthermore, if you get medication from outside the country, it's not FDA approved, and they can't actually, you have neither a legal recourse, nor do you have any ability to even tr have the FDA trace where that came from. Another thing about it is that, another myth is that Canadian prices are cheaper. This is actually something that came up in Maine, which has been proposing an importation uh, a bill in the legislature to bring in drugs from overseas to try and save money. Um, the truth is that when we actually looked at the top 10 drugs they were going to bring into the country, in many cases there was a generic in the U.S. that was cheaper than what the Canadian price was. And it was not, in fact, a Canadian price because CanaRx, the company that worked here, admitted that those drugs were actually going to come from New Zealand, Australia, the U.K., and other places. So quite often, the, the claim that Canadian medications are cheaper is false for two reasons, one of which is that those are not Canadian medications that you're getting, but also that you can actually get a generic product cheaper. Um, I mentioned this before, but Canadian pharmacists cannot legally fill American prescriptions. So any Canadian pharmacy that says that they can fill an American doctor's written prescription really is not using the prescription for anything. If a real Canadian pharmacist actually wanted to fill that prescription, they would be endangering their pharmacy license, which, as we all know, takes years to get, and lots of school, and probably all student loans. Another popular, concept, another popular myth is that you can actually bill insurance back for imported drugs. And, uh, and we've seen, actually, a number of physicians get prosecuted by the FDA for billing Medicare back for imported drugs. It is illegal to do that. And while they probably won't necessarily prosecute an individual patient, they certainly are prosecuting medical practices and physicians. So where do these fake pharmacies get their medications? Um, they get them from all over the world. It's remarkably easy to make medication, to make realistic looking pills. Um, the folks at Pfizer who actually are very aggressive about busting fake labs around the world sent us these photos. The one on the left is a lab in which they were making Lipitor, which is what they found in that bucket. Um, and on the right, they were just doing some common unsterile sterilization of bottles that they were then going to put an antibiotic in. And they had all sorts of labels on them. They were presumably going to peel them off and put a new set on. There are very, very few security features that you can use to try and spot a fake drug. Here are a couple of examples. You can see on the left and right, authentic and fake Lipitor. They look virtually identical. Another number, another number of examples you can see on the right are the approved versus the counterfeit medications. These things are too good a fake for even pharmacists to look at them and tell the difference. They have to go to a lab. And quite often when they find them in a lab and they actually find the fakes, the fakes actually contain a trace amount of the real active pharmaceutical ingredients. So what they'll do is they'll take a batch of Lipitor, for example, and grind it up and then make three batches from it. And there's a great profit margin in that. And you can do a sort of superficial testing and find that it contains the active ingredient. But if you actually dig down, it doesn't contain enough of the actual ingredient to help you. We've seen this with lots, of, lots and lots of drugs. There's probably no drug that has not had a counterfeit incident. We just saw some Adderall, some fake Vicodin, um, there's just a ton of fake tablets out there. They're indistinguishable from the real thing, complete with bubble packs. Bubble packs are one of the easiest things that they seem to fake. So once, once, once you've got someone's attention and you've got a patient who understands that that is a dangerous thing to do to order from an online pharmacy, um, how do you tell them to save money? Because they're not doing it because they want to endanger themselves. 
patients are going to order from these pharmacies because they want to save money. So there's a couple of ways to do it. If the patient is in the doctor's office, which is not a perfectly safe space because of the stories I've told you, patients can ask the, to see the delivery vials. Quite often these things, especially for injectables, are delivered um, in, in bottles that may even be one unit of use, but either way they're going to have a lot number on it. Um, in the Avastin case, the products uh, actually had writing in Arabic, which you will never see for an FDA approved drug. And so, so the, you can take your camera phone, take a picture of it, take a look at the lot number, record that, if it's a bottle, bag, or some other unit, and, and see if you can keep a record of it. You can trace the lot number. That's in fact how many counterfeits are found. You can also simply pay attention to the effects of the drug. Uh, in the case of the weight loss drug Ally, I actually spoke to a woman who in Southern California who bought her uh, a, a dose on eBay and noticed that she was having some very, very odd side effects. And she stopped taking it and then went to her normal pharmacy. She usually goes to a Costco and bought a new batch and then compared the two. And she said, once I actually had what I knew was probably real side by side with the fake, I could tell immediately. So looking for therapeutic failure, while it's very hard to spot, is another good way of spotting a counterfeit and keeping yourself safe. And frankly, if you're having therapeutic failure or weird side effects, you're going to want to talk to your doctor anyway. Another way, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, of course, is to work with needy meds. Um, they are one of the best, most up-to-date databases of discounts for medications around. Um, and so I, I will talk to you more about that. I think it's great. <laughs> we love them as a member. Another thing to do is to shop around online. Now, there are web pharmacies that have been reviewed to ensure that they have American pharmacy licenses and have been inspected. And the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy does that. And those three or four percent that are safe, those are safe to purchase from. And so they carry a special program called the VIPS seal for a verified internet pharmacy practice that you can use to tell people to look for when, shot, when trying to figure out a safe pharmacy. And so we just did this last year. My wife actually, I'm sorry, two years ago, my wife actually does take Advair. And so I asked her to look at a number of asthma drugs uh, online and then look at the price difference. And you can see by looking at these different places that the price difference was significant. So over a year, if you're taking that Advair Discus 150, depending on where you bought it, you could save you know $1,300 on your dosing for a year. So you can still get the savings of comparison shopping online without actually endangering yourself by only picking pharmacies with the VIPS seal. Uh, I mentioned this before, but in many cases, you can find a cheaper generic in the US from a real pharmacy like a VIPS pharmacy than if you try and buy the brand name from a fake web pharmacy, because they are going to try and charge what the, the, the product, the brand name product actually is, is costing. So there's a number of resources on our website, which you should, you're welcome to take advantage of and download for free. There's a, a brochure that covers these tips, save money safely on your prescriptions. There's also um, an interactive uh, flash piece about the five kinds of poisons that you find in fake medications. Um, there's five secrets Canadian web pharmacies don't want you to know, which cover those five myths. And then a couple of other ones, safe drug and safe savings, that cover exactly um, different ways of advice. And then we have a special report on uh, on children and fake drugs. Uh, and then finally, we can take questions and answers. I just want to mention that we do do a number of patient group specific outreach programs. Uh, we partner with our members, like the Men's Health Network, and we'll do a special report, for example, on counterfeits in men's health. And so if you are interested in working with us on that, um, we would invite you to join PSM. Our dues are very low, they're $100 a year. And we would love to craft a program to work with your specific patient community and probably pay for it. <laughs> so uh, we'd be very, very happy to work together. 
Uh, now, uh, Elizabeth, I'd be happy to do questions if there are some of those. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we did have a few questions come in, just a few basic things. We will have, um, you'll get an email with a link to um, a place where you can download the PowerPoint. And this webinar was recorded, so we'll have that up on our website probably within a week or so, so you can check back to our website or our YouTube page for the video. Um, so if you do want to start typing in questions, um, we can do a few. Uh, there's a question about whether you're, if you're traveling abroad and you need a prescription, can you call your U.S. doctor um, for a temporary refill? How does that work? Well, so that's a really good question. You've got two problems there. The one of which is you have to find a valid prescription. And the second of which is you have to find a place that you trust that is a valid pharmacy. Um, and yes, I believe that your doctor will be happy to write you a temporary prescription for a refill um, if your doctor doesn't dislike you for some reason. The harder question is to figure out um, what is um, a valid pharmacy. And usually I recommend that people who are traveling try and go to a hospital to fill a prescription because they're going to be the most likely to be best regulated in a country in which you're not sure if everybody who's selling medication is properly reg regulated. In India, for example, I would never buy a prescription anywhere except a hospital, and even then I would be a little bit careful about what I got because the counterfeit problem is very significant in India and in China. But if you're going to find the, the best regulated place you're going to find who's going to be the most careful about what they dispense is going to be in a hospital. Thank you. Um, there's a question about whether you're breaking the law if you buy legal drugs outside the country. So there is, if yes, uh, in most cases you are breaking the law. There is an exception for personal importation of medication from outside the country, but it is not as broad as people think. You cannot, for example, leave the country and buy Lipitor and bring it back. Um, it has to be more along the lines of drugs that are not available in the U.S. And so it is not actually legal to do so. Now the truth is that the FDA does not prosecute individual patients for doing this. Um, their, their focus has been on the sellers of this medication or the others who facilitate it, like the websites or the payment processors who process the transactions. That's where they've been spending their time, but it is not in fact legal for a patient just to decide to switch all their prescription filling to a web pharmacy outside the country. Okay, um, there's actually a question about our discount card, um, if pharmacists can reject them. There are pharmacies that agree to accept our card, and that's all the major chains. And I believe we're up over 70,000. So you can go to our website, do a zip code search to make sure um, a pharmacy accepts the card. And if they do, then they do need to accept it, like the companies agreed to. Um, OK, so I'm just reading through about whether any online pharmacies are safe. So I do think um, should be our show to fly that there are a few that have been um, looked at. So the question is, what prevents a counterfeit online pharmacy from counterfeiting the seal you showed us? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. So um, when you work in the international space and you realize that not everybody cares about US laws, people that do seal programs like this um, work on the basis of trademark and copyright. So the VIP seal um, is trademarked and copyrighted, but I think it's the trademark that actually works better. And they tend to shut these organizations down uh, through that method. However, a really good way of shopping safely is to actually go to that, that website, vips.info, where they have the list of all of the licensed VIPS pharmacies. And so you can do your shopping from there. So when we do our comparison charts, trying to figure out where to get, what the price range and differences of ad bearer from different online pharmacies, that's how we do it. We actually go to vips.info and we pull all the pharmacies and go ahead and, and, and surf to there from, from that list as opposed to just randomly Googling VIPS pharmacy in which, yeah, you might find someone who's faked the seal. Okay, thank you. Um, another question coming in. So the question is, are many of the drugs that were prescribed in this country actually made in other countries anyway? How safe is the supply that we get from our own pharmacies? So instances of, of counterfeits in the valid, in the secure supply chain in, in pharma, licensed pharmacies in the U.S. are very, very rare. 
they're extremely they're rare enough that I would say that you're you're nearly perfectly safe in in the sense that nothing in life is ever perfectly safe. But if you are going to encounter a counterfeit drug in your life, it is not going to be through a registered and licensed pharmacy. Many of the products that we take and use every day are made in other countries, and that includes pharmaceuticals. However, the manufacturers of those pharmaceuticals are inspected by the FDA. Now, the, the, the frequency with which they're, they're inspected is a, a popular topic of debate amongst policymakers and in Congress. But if you are a major manufacturer and you've got a factory, let's say, in China, that factory has to be inspected by the FDA. It can, and it's under regulatory authority by the FDA. So whether or not it's in the U.S., they are in fact regulated by the, a and inspect, by the FDA and inspected by them. So those are actually very comfortable. You could have right next to it another factory that is not regulated by the FDA, and I would not want anything made in that factory. Okay. There's a question about whether the sequester will affect pharmacies, medications, anything that related to this webinar today. Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> um, I mean, to the extent that the sequester seems to affect uh, like 10% of all spending, um, it is presumed that at some point, somewhere, someone who has an oversight and regulatory safety burden is going to actually lose some part of their funding. And to that extent, inspections will probably take longer. But I don't specifically know if there's a direct connection between the sequester and drug safety. I just presume there is because there's a connection between the sequester and everything. Yeah, I would think so. Okay, um, you know, I think we're going to wrap up. So thank you all for attending this webinar. Um, thank you, Shabir, for being our presenter today. Um, again, you'll receive an email with the link to download this PowerPoint, and the video will be up on our website hopefully within a week or so. Um, for any questions um, about this presentation, you see um, Shabir's email address there. For any questions about needy meds um, or how to access our resources, you can email me. That's just Elizabeth at needymeds.org, but you'll also be receiving an email from me, so you'll get my contact information. Um, I would also attend, um, encourage you to visit our webinar page. Um, this is where we post all of our free webinars that we do, including the regular webinars I do going over our resources. The next one is on the 30th if you want to learn a little bit more about needy meds as well as these special topic webinars we do as well. And, yep, just as Shabir mentioned, you can always go to our website, you know, if you are looking for a more secure way to find some lower cost medications and discount medications, use the resources we list, use our discount card, and um, visit savemedicines.org for questions about um, shopping for on the online pharmacies and everything we covered today. So I hope you all have a great afternoon, and um, thank you again. Thank you, everybody.